Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Omnia Performance Podcast. I'm Fergus Crawley. I'm Johnny Payne. And we have guest Dr. Phil. Not the Dr. Phil you're thinking, but an, <laughs> an equally excellent Dr. Phil is back. I might grow a tash <laughs> just so I can. <laughs> you should me, you should. Yeah. <laughs> just to think I'm a bit like Tom Selleck. <laughs> both, both, both. Great options. Great options. <laughs> um, we are here today to talk about. Something quite conceptual, actually. Something we incorporate into our methodology at Omnia, which is the concept of pre-fatigue, but in quite a specific way to hybrid training. We're going to pass that over to Dr. Phil with his now moustache ambitions to discuss from a research perspective what the potential is to explore it, what his perspective is, and how it can be implemented in training at home from our methodological point of view, or maybe oh, even well methodological in well your played. training. Thank you. I, I was worried when I committed to that sentence, hmm. rather I was just going to go, <laughs> blah, 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 <laughs> which people wouldn't know what I meant. People would have known what I meant. You've completely thrown me off there. What on earth? You had that, how one, have you done that, that? one word. How have you, that I have crumbled. Well right, yeah. played, sir. Well played. Anyway, housekeeping. <laughs> just do this stuff. Subscribe, follow, share. Cheers. Thanks. Right. Johnny, pre yeah. fatigue. What, uh, how do we implement it? Lay out our stall, go. So w what we do with a lot of athletes, and, and some of them will, will look at this fondly, and some of them will look at it and think, oh, God, it's it's Friday, it, usually in people's uh, microscope. We are recording this on a Friday. <laughs> yes, yes so there will be people, uh, if, uh, if we look into our training uh, files right now, thinking about not doing these sessions. <laughs> uh, so what, what we tend to try and do is, is something that we're calling pre-fatigue, uh, and, and what we're doing... There's a psychological factor to it, we can, we can come back to later, but essentially we're looking at exhausting the muscles from a, a kind of, we consider it biomechanically, we're exhausting the muscles we may use in an endurance session later um, in order to produce a, a, an onset of fatigue so that as they then, and I'll, I'll map this out better in a second, but as they then attend to the endurance uh, element of that particular training session, they're already in a state of fatigue that a longer endurance session may have uh, uh, elicited. Does that make sense so far? Would have taken longer to elicit. Yeah. 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 So as a, in a practical sense, and, and Fergus was the guinea pig for some of this in actual fact, what we had Fergus doing, it, this is lead up to, correct me if I'm wrong, well, to... Well, it, was, it probably started with the, um, was the first lunging kill. on the Fridays. Yeah. Thinking back, actually, lunging out on the Fridays ahead of my 100 miler where I had my incrementally big runs on the Saturday. Yeah. A good example, what we're doing at the moment is, is uh, kettlebell, kettlebell um, reverse lunges. Um, uh, this is before bike rides, so we're kind of trying to mimic the, the isometric shape, if you like, the hold of, of, of somebody maintaining that uh, tri position. Reverse lunges, once they're completely fatigued, we'll do some squats immediately into these squats until Fergus couldn't do it anymore. He did enough rest as he needed to continue to hit X amount of reps, and obviously as, as he adapted to that, those reps became uh, more and more, didn't they? To the point 500 of, of the 500 or yes. so. And then immediately onto the bike and immediately out into the session. So what we're trying to do from a, from a scheduling perspective almost is to, is to take what could have and perhaps should have been a three-hour session on the bike and condense it with this pre-fatigue work into being maybe an hour on, on the bike because he's already, he's already exhausted in, in the same manner that the bike would, would carry on. You want to interject? But also... Here with the residual fatigue effects carried into the following day, because we tend to do these the day before our longest endurance sessions of the week. Yeah, so yeah. I think the summary is we aim to elicit localized fatigue ahead of time so that when we're doing our endurance work, we're eliciting systemic fatigue and adaptation is occurring sooner than it might have otherwise occurred, which means that from a hybrid point of view, because we can't get away with the same mileage as regular normal endurance athletes just doing endurance volume, we would therefore get away with the same amount of adaptation to some degree or the same net result in terms of adaptation for less overall mileage in theory. As you said, there's a the psychological elements to it as well, which are, which are key, and, and there's skill. the efficiency elements yeah, that's which come into it. The, 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 yeah, the efficiency elements. So if we look at running as, a, as an easier example, in actual fact, if we then put somebody in that position after they've done the pre-fatigue work uh, into you know, X amount of time run, uh, they're then more fatigued and have to concentrate harder on, on efficiency of, of technique on, on their gait, uh, things that might be more tired at that point, uh, they then have to bring into line uh, and, and lose less energy. So that's a concept, a, a very high level kind of uh, description of the concept, but something I know when we were down at uh, PerformX that we discussed briefly, uh, something you've been intrigued by and something that you quite like. From your perspective, what 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 do you think it is that... that uh, 
kind of tickles your fancy as far as that particular concept is concerned. What, when you look at that and think, hmm, that seems interesting, what are you seeing? Mm. Yeah, it was, it's just a very new concept, which kind of made, I would say made sense to me. It would, it, so I used to go running with a fellow physiologist at St. Mary's, he used to do it in the mornings. And he'd often tell me the story how when he was actually really training for some of his endurance work, he would uh, listen to an album uh, f when he started his runs. And then he knew his like main run would start when the album had finished because like, he knew he had to be out on his feet for quite a long time. Uh, and it's almost like that album, whether it would be like 45 minutes, it kind of acted like a, almost like a warm up. And he knew the last portion of that run was one where he would get the most aerobic type adaptations okay. from. So when he hit the end of that album, <clears throat> this is okay, so now the work starts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking, well, okay, well, if you came into it in a fatigued state, do you reach that level at the end of the session earlier? Because you, you know you, you're not. It's not like you're trying to miss the warm up, but the the body will get into a position where the running is developing a certain level of stress on the athlete because you've been up on your feet longer. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're pre fatigued from the previous day, you might reach that quicker. Okay, so are we actively getting into a certain state of stress quicker, which will be good for generating aerobic adaptations? So. Yeah, that's where it sort of interested me because it came from like what you're doing and then uh, an anecdote from like a friend who was a physiologist. I was like, well, okay, well, this is quite interesting. So the key things I was wanted to think about would be, okay, what kind of fatigue is being carried over? Because you do it on the day before. So usually... And, and the day of. So we tend to... We okay. tend to so yeah. that there is a... The way it would tend to work for the countman, for example... Uh, would be incrementally building reverse lunges plus goblet squats to failure with a kettlebell, then rest, then go again. Horrendous. Would not recommend, but would recommend to those on our <laughs> recommended training program, program yeah. for you at the moment, <laughs> as it is, it was highly effective. But the, but the premise is to to fatigue me in the areas that were most relevant to where I was weak in my triad position over time. I would then spend time in that position, which would be hor horrifically uncomfortable, but would be forcing me to really focus on my efficiency and feeling where things weren't quite right. And that would be alternating um, between bike and run week to week because there were it was five mile runs or one hour on the bike after that session, mm. and then that drilled position and that drilled perception of position and feeling and efficiency would carry over into the following day, where the psychological element takes in, which sorry takes over, which is probably worth mentioning now. So you've got the big picture from our perspective. So the fatigue that is accrued from the full week and then that Friday strength endurance chipper style session plus that sort of forced efficiency element means that when you go out for your long ride, your long run, it feels terrible, which is one from a psychological point of view, forcing you to think, oh, maybe today's not my day. Oh, it shouldn't feel this bad. And then when you get through it, you think, okay, that's yeah, a bit of confidence you're building. You're learning what terrible feels yeah. like. Yeah. And secondly, it's putting you in an overall ele elevated state of fatigue, which is going to be something you're going to experience on mile 60 out of your 100-mile race, for example, or mile 80 out of your 112-mile race yeah. during an Ironman. So, so we want to people, do those 80 miles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's it. So it, it's a way for people to feel that. And I think where we found a lot of people have come to us that have almost failed at races before in the past is they haven't been able to perceive the worst parts of the thing they're training for because you can't train for those worst parts without having experienced the worst parts of the thing you're training for. So it's a bit of a false economy where until you try something and fail, you're not going to know why you're failing. So we try and get that into training through yeah. that manipulation of fatigue so it feels terrible and then also the efficiency that's developed over time and the fact that from a psychological point of view, you're winning in compromised circumstances plus the then physiological elements that we've discussed. Okay, That's the yeah. broader picture so, that we, we piece, piece it together with. Concept, where this come f came from, for me, was fighting. So we would do something called shark tanking. I don't know if you've, either of you have heard of that or not. I'm scared of sharks, so I'm This is horrible as it sounds. So shark tanking, generally you res reserve for a fighter uh, leading up to a big fight. It's a kind of an old school method, but it still exists. And it's still bloody useful. Is that if, if I'm training for a fight and it's five rounds, then... As I get closer and closer to the fight, what we'll do is put me in the middle. It's me that's training for the fight. And every minute a fresh guy comes in. So I'm already fatigued. And these fresh guys are coming in and I've got to fight each one of them who isn't at the same level of fatigue as me. So my skill set has to, has to kind of lift, if you like, 
to meet the demand of my ex excessive fatigue, which is being uh, uh, pressured uh, by, by uh, crisp, clean skill. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm being done by, by, by these lads who are totally fresh every time. So my, my skill under fatigue has to, has to be really, really nailed. If I, and what we're trying to mimic in that situation is, look, three rounds down, all the adrenaline through you and, and, and a, a guy with the same amount of skill and maybe more will or however that you want, you want to play that one out in your head. Uh, have you got what it takes to kind of keep going here and applying skill, not just your, your willpower, etc. So the same as that, that's kind of where the pre fatigue concept came for me in this endurance setting is like, okay, so if you can put somebody under the pressure of being in that kind of race situation or that, that longer uh, uh, in, uh, time frame without them actually having to go through a fight or without them having to actually go through a, that, that 80 mile run to get that feeling of the 80 mile run. How can we do it? So that's where that pre-fatigue idea came from. But the day of, this comes back to maybe where you're uh, going to shed even deeper uh, granularity on this for us, hopefully, Phil, is that I think there's probably some physiological, uh, 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 maybe mitochondrial adaption here that's happening or that we're kind of forcing to happen, not dissimilar to what people hope happens in fasting with autophagy and things, is that if we can deplete resources before the before the actual uh, uh, exercise bout itself, then we're going to create a different adaptive response than if we went into that fresh and fed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that does make sense. I'm wondering if uh, one of the because your attention essentially you're trying to coach compromise running. There's a level of fatigue. Yeah. Your maximal or, or, ability. Or cycling or yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever the discipline. Compromise running and. The psychological <coughs> effects of how that feels. Yeah. yeah. So if I think from like a physiological point of view, there's probably going to be less force output coming from the musculature, but that's okay because it's zone. Let's say it's zone two. So yeah. it does. You, you're not required high forces generated really quickly. So the, the fact that your fast twitch fibers it's are always zone two. What we're going into for that. Yeah. Scenario. So you wouldn't be required to call on them as much. So that, okay, that makes sense. Um. I'd be very interested in how the neuromuscular sort of peripheral fatigue that's happening at the muscle level would then affect blood flow to the muscle. So ultimately, an effective muscle that's acting in endurance exercise is, you know, you're going to get oxygenated blood sent to the muscle. Uh, then that diffuses into the muscle so it can be utilized by the mitochondria for energy. And then you've got the deoxygenated uh, blood goes back to the heart. Um so what happens during exercise is as the intensity goes up, obviously the amount of deoxygenated blood starts to increase because more has been utilized by the uh, periphery, by the, by the muscles. So you start to get a shift in like how much is oxygenated and deoxygenated. Now what p some people might struggle with is muscle relaxation. So one of the key things about the muscle pump is getting that deoxygenated blood back to the heart because it then needs to be uh, oxygenated again yeah. if it can't relax that acts as almost like a like it's the muscles always on almost like kind of not, cool. it's not isometric but it's kind of always us well always on but that is okay for uh, oxygenated blood coming through because it's coming from like the arteries more pressure pushing into the and being pushed from the heart, whereas the muscle pump, which tries to get that deoxygenated uh, blood back to the heart, is fighting against gravity. It's not as effective as the heart. Uh, so what you start to get is it's almost like a pooling, yep. um, which isn't very effective because you know you're getting oxygenated blood there. It's not being utilised as properly, and the deoxygenated blood is not getting back as well as it could do. Um, so that means force production or energy be utilised by the muscle is going to be uh, compromised so if under fatigue conditions how does that affect that uh, particular process happening and if you can have that ability to contract and relax so you have that process of uh, return and uh, blood going to the muscle and coming back under fatigue conditions what happens if you then did that for a few weeks and then suddenly did it with that did it without yeah. Uh, not fatigue conditions yeah. would it be really quite effective because you're you're training it in a uh Tide, I don't want to use the word tide because tide sounds like it's energy you've used and all of a sudden, yeah, it's yeah. compromised yeah, by yes. stuff that you can't really control. You're, like, you're deliberately yes, doing yes, this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I wonder if it 
influences the ability to, of the well, muscle so to relax. Because it's tired, it can't contract and relax as well as it could. Much more succinctly and intelligently put th than, than would have taken me about three quarters of an hour to say. But that's the kind of concept in, in, in my brain is that w further down the road, if you look at the training, the way we might lay it out over a, a six-week period or something, mm. we'll then remove that stressor um, altogether for a few sessions and then that's kind of where we'll test and retest. We're going to test during and see what, see what the effect is. And it's soft testing. We're not saying, right, we're testing today. We're looking at the data coming in and saying, mm. okay, so we know that X, Y, and Z happens when we... When we you'd have to repeat that over and over with the same athlete over and over, I think, or, or with, within the same, so a study, essentially, where we'd have to look at, you know, what happens within these repeat bouts over and over, what happens universally, what, what are the, the, uh, the, the confounding factors or, or, the, or the variables that we can't control, et cetera, et cetera. But it seems to me that conceptually there's something there. Now, I'm not going to pretend to be intelligent enough to, to know exactly what's happening on the molecular level because we, we haven't looked at this in much detail, but I'm kind of... From, from looking at the anecdotal response, uh, if you like, from, from our athletes, Fergus being one, who've gone through this process, uh, and knowing that I've done this with plenty of athletes without this process beforehand, this mm. is over the past four or so years, it's been a, a practice of mine, is there does seem to be so something to be gained by it. Uh, and the gains tend to come in, in one is just simple practicality, uh, a sense, practical sense, is that we're now reducing the amount of time that they actually have to train. Because if you go back to that 80 to 100 mile of your man listening to the album scenario, mm. now he doesn't have to listen to the album or he doesn't have to do the 80 miles. He can just drop into that session with the album already heard if, mm. if we're going to follow that metaphor. But yeah, put it on two and a half on Audible. Yeah, yeah. So so that's kind of one one idea. <laughs> really, is how, how do we? It's this notion that to run a marathon, you're going to have to run eight or so marathons in training, which isn't, isn't the case. We need to train you to the point at which that is, once we remove all those extra fatigue mm. elements, you're, you're able to go through that. Um, but I think there's something must be happening at that kind of physiological level that's that's useful and, and potent. Um, what exactly that is, like, like the last episode, you know, how many different ways we skin this and open it up and have a look at it. We might go, oh, no, it's not. Oh, maybe this. But there's something there, I think, that's useful. And, and there's probably plenty of minds, yours being one of them, that can kind of open the bonnet already and say, well, these are the three or four things that might be happening and, and, uh, and play with that idea. But uh, it... On, on a very s uh, uh, simple sense, we know it does produce pretty good results mm -hmm. uh, compar compared to doing it without that uh, driver there. I mean, we haven't we haven't produced a scientific study within that kind of. On that, well, I, don't think, I don't think if you were to if you were to hypothesize on how you would set up this study, I know you'll give a very scientific answer saying you know, variables this, variables that, budgeting this, budgeting that. Forget all that, Phil. Step outside. Step outside your normal parameters and create this study for us. How how do you, to, to to sort of give proof of concept to what we have seen very positive anecdotal results from? What do you think the necessary considerations would be to make an effective study for this? God, you can cut. You can attack this at so many different angles. Yeah. I'd first want to see what happens. I'd create a crossover study, I think, first. So let's say they've got a three-hour run as they come in, do their three-hour run. We measure their, measure their muscle oxygenation using NIRS, or so near infrared spectroscopy. Uh, and I would probably you know, use gas analyzing to measure their uh, oxygen and CO2 release so we can get some idea around the physiological profile of them running during a uh, three-hour run. Yeah. Uh, might need to do some pre-testing of that so we can actually know what their zone zone two is. Yeah. So they are running at a pace that's appropriate for the intensity that we want them at. Uh, but before one of the three-hour runs, I think I'll do a pre-fatigue session and then you'd have something to compare. So you've then got a three-hour run unfatigued and a three-hour run fatigued. And okay, let's see what happens to the muscle oxygenation as you go through it. And you probably need to measure it <clears throat> as you go through. Are there actually changes on like hour one, hour two, hour three, whatever it, it might be? Um, if you're using, that might be, I'm thinking of like variables to control. If you give them too much autonomy, then there's a lack of control there to really understand what's going on. Um, so yeah, that's probably what I would do. I would probably get, okay, two, three hour runs, but on one of them, you're going to do a pre-fatigue and we're going to look at some physiological markers to see if there's any difference. Um, but we're also going to measure them by hour. So that means, okay, uh, if pre-fatigued or not, 
what what state they're at one hour two hours because you know the idea behind the your idea is that they can run two hours instead of three because of the the pre fatigue and we still get the same physiological response yeah. so is there a difference between their first hour uh, while running pre fatigued we don't know mm-hmm. um, that's not to say that there is a there isn't a difference or there is a difference I just don't know but anecdotally from your work we're seeing a big difference so that's why we'd probably want to investigate there first that would be my first port of call that makes sense to me makes that's, sense yeah. fascinating yeah. yeah yeah well and then after that dig deeper keep physically find yeah. more funding yeah. keep <laughs> keep going because that would be a good pilot study i think because you're yeah. just looking at looking at one compared to the other as long yeah as the exactly testing is right you know, maybe f- ventilatory threshold or something as a, as yeah a, as yeah a, as a means of controlling their, their overall output that's the reason uh, i'd probably testing. start looking at their biomechanics on the second study yeah because the idea that fatigue can affect your kinesthetic awareness and a lot of the time you don't want to run while heavily fatigued because it's going to change your gait some so much sure. that you're going to start running in a different way that loads certain structures which they may not be ready for and that could potentially lead to injury but obviously if you've got enough time between sessions where they still have that residual fatigue but it's not like real fatigue that's going to really negatively affect it you want to find that sweet spot yeah so okay when they're running pre-fatigued do we see differences between if they were fatigued or not? Yeah, that'd be interesting. You and know, it, if they're it, running at the same there, time, drop-off point in terms of time. Yeah, can they go ninety minutes before they suddenly start knees caving in, hips start caving in, all this stuff? And yeah, therefore, yeah. Where, where's the point of diminishing returns? Loads of questions. Loads of questions, and not questions we're going to get the answer to today. So, probably worth just summarising that we've we've laid out our stall, we've hypothesised on a study that could happen. So, if anyone would like to fund it. You know where to find us. <laughs> well, definitely me. You know, the guy, I, you know yeah, if you want to do an yeah. MRes or S and C degree. St. Mary's to confirm that is that is. Yeah. And, and uh, we'd encourage you to go through his undergrad and master's process first because you get more more time with Phil. So that's what we're all here for, really, isn't it? <laughs> Any <laughs> final points to that you're you're desperate to get out? No, no, I, I've enjoyed it because it's uh, it's an interesting concept to me for obvious reasons, uh, and and there, I definitely think there's scope for for uh, research. So yeah. It, genuinely, I think if you if you feel that that's been interesting to you, get in touch, tell us why, and then let's all go down the rabbit hole together somehow. No, I'm, I'm, I really want to set up these questions in a laboratory because you know there's a lot of things that we can answer here. Mm-hmm. I really think, I think it's I think it's a fascinating thing, and the reason that we haven't really looked at this already is because the idea of hybrid training is still in its infancy when it comes to. The academic process and research. Yeah, yeah. It's cool just, just, just very quickly. It's because the majority of research is focused on concurrent training rather than hybrid training, isn't it? Which the subtle difference is. Well, concurrent training could be just training two different uh, modalities or trying to improve in two different modalities at the same time. Um, so that could be, for example, that you're a runner and you're just doing strength training to try and improve your running performance. Um, but, you know, you don't, you're not deliberately trying to get better at strength. You're just doing strength to improve your running performance. Or you need to be, you know, strong and fit for a sport like rugby. Whereas hybrid training, I think, is like you are actively trying to be better at powerlifting or at triathlon. Separate, separate sports, separate yeah. disciplines, isn't it? Yeah. Whether you're doing that on the same day or at separate days, depending on your goals, that doesn't matter. You're actively trying to improve in both sports at the same time, mm. which I think is different. And yeah. that changes the programming for it. Yeah. yeah. Just a key nuance there to set up any future podcasts that we do on this topic. And just as general definitions go, it's useful to know because a lot of the research has been done on concurrent training, hybrid training, as Phil said, in its infancy. For now, we've asked some important questions today. Some of you might have deep pockets. Let's make it happen. And what else should we make happen? Hit follow, hit subscribe, share with a friend. Make sure you've rated and reviewed the show. And do drop us a line if you have any further questions, queries, comments, or emotions that you would like to share. Thank you very much and see you next time.